Welcome to Becoming Bossy. Today, we will discuss part two of the Certified Internal Auditor exam with a focus on domain one. This domain comprises 20% of the total exam score. Here are the syllabus objectives for domain one. Number one, internal audit operations. A, describe policies and procedures for the planning, organizing, directing, and monitoring of internal audit operations. B, interpret administrative activities such as budgeting, resourcing, recruiting, staffing, etc. of the internal audit activity. Both of these are at a basic level of understanding. Number two, establishing a risk-based internal audit plan. A, identify sources of potential engagements such as audit universe, audit cycle requirements, management requests, regulatory mandates, relevant market and industry trends, emerging issues, etc. B, identify a risk management framework to assess risks and prioritize audit engagements based on the results of a risk assessment. C, interpret the types of assurance engagements such as risk and control assessments, audits of third parties, and contract compliance, security and privacy, performance and quality audits, key performance indicators, operational audits, financial and regulatory compliance audits. D, interpret the types of consulting engagements such as training, system design, system development, due diligence, privacy, benchmarking, internal control assessment, process mapping, etc. designed to provide advice and insight. E. Describe coordination of internal audit efforts with the external auditor, regulatory oversight bodies, and other internal assurance functions, and potential reliance on other assurance providers. Number three, communicating and reporting to senior management and the board. A. Recognize that the chief audit executive communicates the annual audit plan to senior management and the board and seeks the board's approval. B, identify significant risk exposures and control and governance issues for the chief audit executive to report to the board. C, recognize that the chief audit executive reports on the overall effectiveness of the organization's internal control and risk management processes to senior management and the board. D, recognize internal audit key performance indicators that the chief audit executive communicates to senior management and the board periodically. Now, let's discuss CIA Part 2, Domain 1. Before we start, go ahead and like the video and subscribe to the channel. We will discuss managing the internal audit activity. Let's start with internal audit operations. For an internal audit function to accomplish the organization's goals, internal audit leaders, such as the chief audit executive and directors, must manage the internal audit function effectively. Management is the attainment of organizational goals in an efficient and effective manner through four main activities, planning, organizing, directing, and controlling. Planning involves drafting the vision for the organization and determining the goals and strategy for the organization's future. Internal audit planning particularly includes developing the annual audit plan and assessing risks. If you fail to plan, then you plan to fail. So the first step is critical to the effectiveness of subsequent steps. Organizing typically involves creating work groups based on individuals' strengths and areas for improvement, as well as prioritizing tasks and assigning tasks. The chief audit executive can also decide if the department will have multiple job levels to create a tall structure or few job levels to create a flat structure. Directing involves leading the audit department and motivating all levels of the internal audit department from staff to managers to directors. Controlling, which also includes monitoring, involves continually monitoring the audit plan the department's progress, and determining if risks increase in severity and likelihood. This may result in changes to the audit plan. Risk-based internal audit plan. The internal audit plan should be based on the results of a comprehensive risk assessment. Risk levels may be quantified by considering the likelihood of the risk occurring, multiplied by the impact or severity of the risk event. For example, 
If we are a telecommunications company and there is a medium likelihood that natural disasters could disrupt our services, but there is a high impact when the disruption may occur, we may assess that risk as an overall high risk and mitigate that risk by hiring a recovery team, such as a disaster recovery team, or purchasing a large amount of insurance in case damage to the company's assets is more than we can handle as an internal organization. When performing risk assessments, we consider the nature and scope of various activities, threats, services, and controls. Remember, internal audit plans should be risk-based. Assurance engagements. These engagements are objective examinations initiated by an engagement letter where internal auditors inspect evidence from audit clients and assess the efficiency and effectiveness of the client's governance, risk management, and control processes. There is typically an opinion written by the internal auditor about the organization or the function being audited. An audit program is developed to test the function or organization's existing controls and to identify control gaps. Consulting engagements. These engagements are advisory in nature. So when I say advisory, I mean that we're typically giving our clients advice or we are proposing suggestions or recommendations. These engagements are intended to inform clients about the strengths, weaknesses, and areas of improvement for the function or organization under examination. Some forms of consulting engagements are due diligence reviews for potential mergers and acquisitions, as well as benchmarking studies to determine if a function or organization is underperforming or outperforming its peers. Coordination between internal auditors and others. Internal auditors generally have to coordinate with different parties during assurance and consulting engagements. These parties may include external auditors, management, such as the chief executive officer, the audited function or department leaders, audit committee members, and the board of directors. For example, significant and high risk observations or findings should be communicated to the audit committee for informational purposes. That leads us to communicating and reporting. Examples of items that should be communicated are key performance metrics, the internal audit plan, and significant risks that could threaten the organization or company's success. Audit conclusions are reported to management as well as the audit committee, especially if they are high risk. If external auditors are relying on internal audits work, those internal work papers and related conclusions should be communicated to the external auditors. Now, let's answer some practice questions. Number one, which of the following is the key performance indicator for an internal audit activity? A, number of audit clients satisfied. B, number of audit recommendations made. C, number of audit recommendations accepted. Or D, number of audit recommendations implemented. So we're looking for the KPI for an internal audit activity. Let's go through, through the list of those that are not the answer. So B, number of audit recommendations made. The fact is that we can make numerous recommendations, right? However, all of those recommendations may not provide value or add value to the, in, to the internal audit client. So just because we propose several recommendations doesn't mean that it's necessarily adding value to the risk management, governance, and control system within the organization. So that is not correct. C, number of audit recommendations accepted. Management has the ability and the, the choice of accepting certain recommendations and declining or denying certain recommendations. And although our recommendations may add value and provide insight, management Management may not always see it that way, so they don't have to accept our recommendations. So that is why C is not the answer as well. D, number of audit recommendations implemented. 
It is great when we propose recommendations and management actually implements them. However, as I mentioned with C, management could just choose to accept the risk with not implementing recommendations. So management does not always implement recommendations, even though they may add value to their department function or organization. So the answer here is A, number of audit clients satisfied. When our audit clients are satisfied, that lets us know that our performance for the internal audit activity was sufficient. And so that is a key performance indicator for an internal audit activity. Number two, interviewing operating personnel, identifying the auditee's objectives, identifying standards used to evaluate performance, and assessing the risks inherent in the auditee's operations are activities performed typically in which phase of an internal audit? A, the fieldwork phase, B, the preliminary survey phase, C, the audit programming phase, or D, the reporting phase. So during this phase, we're interviewing our clients, we are figuring out what their objectives are, and we are identifying what standards or policies they use to evaluate performance. We're also assessing risks. So we would not do this during the fieldwork phase because the fieldwork, the fieldwork phase is when we actually do our testing. So we need to know all this before, prior to beginning our fieldwork testing. C, the audit programming phase. We actually need to do all this information or we, we need to do these activities before the audit programming phase because we need to interview personnel, identify their objectives prior to creating our audit program. So that's why C is not the answer. And then D, the reporting phase. No, the reporting phase is typically the last step of the audit cycle. So we want to interview personnel and identify their objectives prior to reporting final conclusions and recommendations. So the answer here is B, the preliminary survey phase. During the preliminary survey phase, that is when we interview our key process owners. We identify what their objectives are, if it's a consulting engagement. We identify what standards and policies they are using to evaluate effectiveness and efficiency. And we assess risks to determine which areas we want to include in our audit program. So B is the answer. Number three, what should the audit strategy be? A, it should be knowledge-based. B, it should be cycle-based. C, it should be request-based. Or D, it should be risk-based. So I talked about this during the lesson. It should not be knowledge-based because our audit team does not know everything. Even sometimes management doesn't know everything. Sometimes they have to have outsiders or third parties come in to inform them about external environments and other opportunities that are available outside of the company. So the audit strategy should not be knowledge-based because during audits, we typically learn as we go along. We learn as we perform the audit. So A is not correct. B, it should be cycle-based. Remember, we're looking for the best answer. So some areas of audit strategies are cycle-based. For example, HR controls are typically one of the areas that are cycle-based because we want to make sure that we're reviewing HR functions periodically, such as every other year or every three years because HR includes the recruiting, the hiring, and the firing of employees, which is so critical to the success of the organization. However, when you look at areas such as supply chains, or when you look at specific mergers and acquisition audits, those are probably more one-time types of audits or consulting engagements that we may do. So those would not be cycle-based. So generally, B would not be the answer. C, it should be request-based. Well, yes, management can make requests on which areas of the company they want to have examined. However, we also must assess the organization's risks on our own and not just test the areas that management wants to request to be tested. So the answer is D, it should be risk-based. We want to do our, our own risk assessments to identify low risks, medium risks or moderate risks and high risks in order to plan our audit strategy. So the answer is D. Number four, which of the following would not be considered in performing a risk analysis exercise? 
would not be considered in performing a risk analysis exercise? A, system complexity, B, results of prior audits, C, auditor skills, or D, system changes. So, assume that we're performing a risk analysis, we would like to know things such as the complexity of the system, were there any changes to the system, and what were the results when we previously audited the system? Those are things that we would want to know. Now, auditor skills, we would not typically consider those because remember, as we're planning the engagement, we are, we're going to be picking certain staff members, certain managers, and certain IT experts to perform our risk analysis and perform the overall audit. So auditor skills change, right? We can pick and choose people who have certain strengths in certain areas and people who actually want to learn more in related areas as well. So C, audit, auditor skills is not correct. Number five, during the audit of payments under a service contract, the staff auditor finds a $500 recurring monthly reimbursement for rent at a local business. Each reimbursement is authorized by the same project engineer. The auditor finds no provision for payment of temporary living expenses in the service contract. Discussion with the project engineer cannot resolve the matter. The matter. The auditor should A. Inform the audit director. B. Call the engineer into a private meeting to confront him or her with the situation. C. Complete the audit as scheduled, noting the $500 recurring reimbursement in the work papers. Or D. Wait until the engineer is surrounded by plenty of witnesses and then inquire about the payments. So this is a great question. Here we have a situation where there's this recurring $500 monthly reimbursement for rent. We notice that the reimbursement is being authorized by the same engineer and that discussion with the engineer could not resolve the matter. The engineer couldn't tell us why this was, was recurring or what was the purpose of this expense. So what should we do next? Let's look at the, the easy ones that we can eliminate. D, wait until the engineer is surrounded by plenty of witnesses. No, we do not want to do that to inquire of management. So D is definitely not correct. That does not instill a sense of trust uh, with the engineer. That's more of like embarrassing the engineer. So that's not professional at all. So D is not the answer. Uh, C, complete the audit as scheduled, noting the $500 re recurring reimbursement in the work papers. No, we probably do want to include it in the work papers, but we do not want to complete the audit as scheduled. We may have some changes that need to be made. We need to investigate why this $500 recurring reimbursement is in the books. Why is that in the service contract when it shouldn't be? And there's no provision for payment of these types of expenses in the service contract. So C is not the answer. B, call the engineer into a private meeting to confront him or her with the situation. No. First of all, the auditor uh, is not the audit manager and it's not the audit director. So they should not be doing any form of investigation or interview without the presence of a superior figure such as the audit director. So that is why the answer is A, inform the audit director, because we want to make sure that the proper chains of command, such as the audit director, are involved and aware of this recurring reimbursement, and they can use their expertise and experience to figure out what steps need to be taken next. So A is the correct answer. Comment below how well you did. Keep studying. If you enjoyed this lesson, click the like button and subscribe to the channel to be notified of more Certified Internal Auditor Exam videos. Click the join button to see the benefits of being a channel member. As always, stay blessed and stay Boss C.